This is Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 124, the twelfth part of the Ultra Running Stranger Things series. This episode will share the running career of the famous 19th century ultra runner, Nora Mack, and the tragic murder of his wife. On a winter morning in 1883 in Midtown Manhattan, New York, a young boy ran down 34th Street, getting the attention of a policeman. He cried out, A man has killed some folks. Officer John Hughes ran with the boy to a new saloon that had recently opened. There he saw a man pale and trembling. He found out that the man was Charles Noramack, one of the most famous ultra runners or pedestrians in the country. Noramack led the officer up two flights of stairs to the apartment where he lived. On the dining room floor lay two dead bodies, Noramack's young wife Elizabeth and his longtime friend and trainer, George Beatty. A revolver lay on the floor next to Beatty's left hand. The murder and suicide occurred while Nora Mack was downstairs, but his two young children, still crying, had sadly witnessed it all. How could this have happened? George Cameron was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1884. He was the oldest of nine children. His father was a lithograph printer and George took up the same occupation. As a young adult, George became interested in running in 1872 at the age of 20. His first achievement was winning a one mile race in 513 at Powder Hall's Ground, Edinburgh, Scotland. He quickly became recognized as one of the best sprinters in Scotland and would compete in various one mile races during town fairs, always placing high. He improved his one mile personal best time to 421 and won three mile races too. In 1875, at the age of 22, George married 18 year old Elizabeth Edwards. She was also born in Edinburgh, growing up in a large family of nine children. Her father was a pastry and candy maker. Elizabeth also learned the candy making business. She gave birth to four children in Scotland Alexander and daughter Jessie and two others who died as infants. Elizabeth was described as, quote, a short, stout woman with regular features, light complexion, and pleasing manners with blue eyes and brown hair. In 1879, long-distance pedestrianism started to get intense attention in Scotland as Edward Payson Weston barnstormed Great Britain, putting on walking exhibitions and competing in races. With so many others, George entered the sport that year. He was a small man, ideal for long distance running, standing only 5 foot 3 and weighing about 122 pounds. He decided to take up the stage name of Noramac, which is Cameron spelled backwards. He did not originate the idea of using this transposed name as an alias. Other Camerons before him had also used the Noramac alias both in Scotland and America. Noramac's earliest known ultra distance race came in July 1879. He ran in a 26-hour outdoor six-day running tournament in Aberdeen Recreation Grounds in Inches, Scotland. Contestants ran four hours a day and six hours on the last day. It was put on by the 100-mile world record holder George Hazel of London. It was reported, by the finish, an immense concourse of people had congregated within the enclosure who seemed to take on an eager interest in the competition, cheering one or other of the competitors whenever a spurt was made. Normac reached an impressive 156 miles. He continued to win in nearly every race. As Normac became serious about being a professional pedestrian, he hired George Beatty, age 40, to be his trainer handler. He met him in London and hired him. George Beatty was from Scotland and had been a private in the British Army for 22 years and served 12 years in India, where he took part in the Afghanistan War in 1878 and 79. He belonged to the 5th Rifle Brigade, where he became a skilled rifleman and participated in competitions. He had recently retired as a sergeant from the service and was living on a soldier's pension. 
With no living relatives, he went to live with Noramak's family. During 1880, Noramak became a prolific ultra-runner, competing in races multiple times each month throughout Scotland. His race mileage during 1880 exceeded 4,300 miles, and he won 14 out of his 18 races. He especially found winning success competing in the 72-hour race, which was conducted over six days, 12 hours per day. And he set a distance record in Great Britain of 384 miles. He won five out of eight of those type of races. Those in the sport took notice, and he progressed from being called a plucky little novice to a well-known champion. With his great success, Noramak started to compete on the bigger stages and ran in his first six-day race without a daily limit in hours at Victoria Hall in Newport, Wales. He reached 459 miles, winning 70 pounds, valued at $10,500 today, probably more than he could earn in a year doing his printing job. His friend BD traveled with him, performing attendant duties during the races. Noramak received special recognition by the athletic clubs after he broke a British record running 66 miles in 10 hours outdoors in Scotland. Noramak wanted to next compete against Blower Brown of Fulham for the six-day distance championship of the English Astley Belt, but terms with Brown could not be reached. With this frustration, he set his sights on competing in America, where there were more opportunities to race for big money. On May 27, 1881, Noramak and Beatty sailed out of Glasgow, Scotland for America. He left his wife, Elizabeth, behind in Edinburgh, where she had a candy shop. He had his eyes on competing in the Rose 72-hour contest to be held on Coney Island. He did not know at the time, but with what he found in America, he had left his homeland behind forever. They arrived in New York City on June 10th, and in July, he won the Coney Island race. Using his winnings, Noramak opened a saloon called Walker's Rest across the street from the Basilica of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan. He moved into an apartment above the saloon with Beattie, who worked in the saloon as a bartender. Now settled, he sent Beattie back to Scotland to bring pregnant Elizabeth and his two children to join him in America. They arrived on October 12, 1881, on the steamship Circassia. A daughter Jane was born in New York City that year. Noramak next competed in short 5 and 10 mile races in New York City and did well. But he had his eyes on a bigger prize, a six day championship put on by John Ennis in the American Institute in New York City held on December 26, 1881 with 14 starters. This was the biggest race of his short ultra running career. The start was witnessed by 3,000 people. Noramak started slow, but each day climbed the leaderboard. Throughout his career, he became known as a slow starter, who then ran negative splits later in the week. Competitors learned that no early lead over him was safe. Noramak aroused the boys in the dull hours long before daylight by performing lively Scottish airs on an accordion while running the race. The other racers fell behind him, keeping step to the tunes when they were not too fast. Astley belt champion Charles Royal of England was watching, not racing. When asked about the newcomer Noramak, he said, He is a good little man. Now here's a man I think ought to win this race. He's put together well and looks as strong as an ox. In the end, Patrick Fitzgerald of Long Island broke the six-day world record with 582 miles. Noramak finished third with 565 miles, winning $800 valued at $23,000 today. He had quickly established himself as one of the top six-day pedestrians in the world and became convinced that America was the land of his fortunes. Noramak was now accepted to compete against the big boys. His next race was in the historic Madison Square Garden held on February 27, 1882, against a very tough field of 10 championship runners who had all before exceeded 500 miles in six days. 
It was perhaps the greatest six-day race in history. They were competing for a diamond-studded whip. Going into the race, Noramak weighed only 118 pounds, had a 35-inch chest, 13-inch calves, and 18-inch thighs. Madison Square Garden was heated by steam and during the night illuminated by 30 electric lights. Certain windows were boarded up to keep the gate crashers out. The bookmakers were in full force with their tin boxes and sat at little tables near the stand, fitted up for newspaper reporters, timekeepers, and scores. Patrick Gilmer's 50-piece band was hired to play popular songs. The start was witnessed by about 8,000 people. The great gathering was an uproar of excitement when at 12 o'clock by the judge's timepiece, referee Busby gave the word go. The champions bounded away like deer. The race initially was highly competitive, without drama. Although the crowd was large, there was less enthusiasm manifested than had been witnessed in a previous contest. Except when the band of musicians gave vent to their feelings, the scene was almost like a funeral. The spectators stared at each other more oftener than they did at the champions. The massive bar did good business, but ran out of beer and liquors during the first night. Noramak, age 29, the most boyish looking of the competitors, plodded along with his stalwart legs close together, his frail trunk erect, and his thin arms stiff at his side. Another description read, Noramak walks or runs with a straightforward movement, raising his body slightly with each step. On the third day, he was in last place among the remaining seven champions, some who were on world record pace. Normac did not give up and was one of the few that consistently did sprints to increase his pace. At the end of the race, George Hazel broke the six-day world record with 600 miles. Normac climbed into third place with 555 miles, winning him $3,060, valued at $88,000 today. An incredible fortune for a week's work on the track. He seemed nearly exhausted at the finish. For some time he walked painfully, with his mouth open and his lips swollen and discolored. On October 23, 1882, Noramak started in another big-time six-day race in Madison Square Garden for the, quote, Championship of the World. Nine champion runners were in the race, all with 550-plus miles in past six-day finishes. Noramak has trained fine as a thoroughbred. His skin is clear and his eyes shine like a ferret's. He came out wearing striped drab trunks, a white shirt, and a red and blue cap. The initial pace was torrid. After 12 hours, John Hughes had reached 85 miles and Noramak 75. As usual, he slowed and reached 100 miles in just over 18 hours. The band played every 15 minutes, and the colored gas jets were rendered nearly invisible by the brightness of the electric lights. After three and a half days, the race became very tight, with the top six all within 15 miles of each other. On day five, it was reported, Normac was wretched in the extreme. His face was wasted and he walked around with his body bent as if he had pains in his stomach. But he climbed into second place with 507 miles. During the final day, gate crashers poured into the building from a window where the wire grating had been loosened and pulled back. About 50 boys came in per minute. Occasionally the hole would come clogged with boys, and then there would be a momentary stoppage. The wild influx of audience made the garden noisier than it had been for the entire event. For the final evening, Noramak came out looking like a jockey in a bright green cap, brown jacket, and white tights. In the end, Fitzgerald won with 577 miles, and Noramak came in second with a lifetime personal best of 567 miles, which was a Scottish record that has lasted through the ages even to this day. After his infant daughter died, he refrained from racing for several months and likely concentrated on his saloon business. On June 21, 1883, Noramak became a U.S. citizen. Life looked good in America for Noramak. 
In August 1883, Noramax sold his saloon and opened a new one, Midlothian Arms, in Midtown Manhattan. A saloon was on the first floor, and the basement contained a billiard room and a bowling alley. On the third floor was a nice five-room family apartment with a front parlor, two bedrooms, a dining room, and a kitchen. He spent all his savings on the new place. The living quarters was crowded. Nora Max trainer, Beatty, lived with them, slept on a sofa in the parlor. Peter Campbell, Nora Max's brother-in-law, and James Barclay, a Scotsman, lived in one of the bedrooms. Nora Mac, his wife, and little children slept on a large folding bed in the dining room. Another boarder had used the other bedroom, but he had just died from a stroke. B. had become a changed man since he had become associated and drinking so much with gamblers on the sport. He drank so excessively while working as a bartender in his former place that Nora Mac decided to fire him as a bartender. He offered to keep him on as a billiard maker, but that made Beatty angry. Things got nasty. Beatty started to drink heavily and annoy everyone working at the new saloon, especially the new bartender. When Normac and Elizabeth returned one evening from a picnic at the Midlothian Society, he discovered that Beatty had been drunk and tried to boss around the workmen who were putting on the finishing touches for the saloon. A quarrel between the two men led to blows, and Normac knocked Beatty down and gave him two black eyes. Beatty thought Noramac had become ungrateful for all his work for him over the years. Elizabeth had become fed up with Beatty, declaring that he was a nuisance in the house. Beatty, probably in a fit of revenge, told Noramac that Elizabeth had been going out secretly at night, implying that she was having an affair with someone. He was obviously causing some serious domestic stress in the family. It all came to a head on the morning of August 23rd, 1883. Normac threw out some hints of what Beatty had said to him about her while she was making ready to get breakfast. She was angry, and when her husband was going downstairs, she said to him, Beatty has been telling you some lies about me. It is believed that after he left, she confronted Beatty about his lies, and then they had a terrible argument. A little after 10 a.m., a boy ran down West 34th Street and got the attention of a patrolman, John Hughes, telling him that he needed to go to 466 8th Avenue. He asked the boy why. The boy replied, A man has killed some folks. That got Hughes' attention, and he ran to the four-story brick building where Nora Mac had his new saloon and living quarters on the third floor. Nora Mac met the officer at the door. His face was pale, and he was trembling with excitement. Two or three of the men told the policeman that Normac's wife had been killed by his trainer George Beatty, who had killed himself also. They led the way up the two flights of stairs to the rear dining room, on the floor which lay two bodies. Elizabeth Cameron laid near the door of a small kitchen. She had been killed by a bullet which passed through her head. Beatty's body was in the opposite corner, near a window. He was shot in the left side of his head, near the ear. A large British Bulldog revolver lay on the floor, near his left hand. On the dinner table, there were three place settings for breakfast, with bread, fried onions, and some newly cooked liver. Nora Mac looked at his wife's body for a moment, and then sat down on a chair and buried his face in his hands. The policeman took him out of the room and downstairs, and brought to him his six-year-old son, Alexander, who sadly had witnessed the killings. Here is how it happened. Alexander said that his mother and Beatty had quarreled in the kitchen, and that his mother was shot there. She staggered out into the dining room and fell near the door. The boy was too frightened to notice all that happened in the next few seconds, but he heard another shot and saw Beatty fall in the other corner of the room. The two boarders, Campbell and Barkley, who had been up late at night bowling in the basement, had been asleep in the middle room when they were awakened by the first gunshot. They quickly dressed and then heard the second shot. 
Barkley ran downstairs to find Noramac, and Campbell went to investigate. Opening the door, he beheld a sight that for several minutes completely overpowered him. Stretching at full length on the floor lay Mrs. Elizabeth Cameron, with blood gushing from her mouth, saturating her hair. Kneeling over the dying form of Mrs. Cameron were her two children. The elder boy was trying to stop the flow of blood, which came from his mother's mouth. Markley ran downstairs to the saloon where Noramac was behind the bar, waiting until his breakfast was ready. They yelled, Someone is being shot! Normac asked where, and then they told him it was in the dining room. Normac went upstairs to find his children screaming and his wife dying. She gave a last gasp and died without a word. Normac went downstairs, staggered, and fell in a chair, pale, hardly able to speak, and asked someone to get a policeman. A boy was sent. Once the police were through with their investigation after a couple hours, Normac said to a friend, Get his body out of the house. Don't let him stay a moment longer than you can help. Elizabeth Cameron, who died at the young age of 28, was buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Brooklyn. Beattie did not leave behind enough to pay for his burial. The shocking news was published all over America and Great Britain. And some newspapers blamed the whole affair on drinking and the shady gambling sport of pedestrianism. Normac stepped aside from racing for eight months to get his life back together and to start training again. He soon married again to a, quote, little Scotch woman. In April 1884, Normac ran again for six days in Madison Square Garden, where Patrick Fitzgerald broke the world record, raising it to 610 miles. Normac finished in fourth place with 545 miles, winning $1,400. He was on his way again to compete regularly. On November 3rd, 1884, Normac started an attempt to walk 51 miles every day for 100 consecutive days, except Sundays, for 5,100 miles, which would break Edward Payson Weston's record of 5,000 miles in 100 days. The terms included that he could not walk more than 15 hours each day. A wager of $2,000 was made. He walked each day from 9 a.m. to midnight on a tiny indoor sawdust track, 44 laps to a mile, in his own saloon, allowing him to sleep upstairs in his apartment. This was also great marketing for his establishment. 100 people could pack into the small hall, 70 by 28 feet, to watch him make his 8,976 turns each day. For entertainment, a piano and violin played to spur him on. He ate six meals a day and fell to only 102 pounds at one point. He said his room was, quote, spiritless and the excitement was wanting, hence the task was monotonous and dreary. He succeeded on February 26, 1884. This was his most famous running accomplishment. However, some sporting authorities said they would not sanction the record for administrative reasons. He was scored and clocked by competent and reliable people, but he failed to request the assistance of some authority so that the great feat, when accomplished, could not be gainsaid as a record. The fact that he failed to have the timing and scoring authenticated debars the performance from taking precedence over Weston's feat. He vowed to do the attempt again with proper scoring, but never did. In 1885, the first six-day roller skating race was held in Madison Square Garden while Noramac was walking around in circles in his saloon. The event was popular, but not a financial success, and the winner, 18-year-old William Donovan, a newsboy from Elmira, New York, who reached 1,092 miles, died a couple months later from pneumonia. See episode 82. But despite these disappointments, another roller skating match was scheduled, and Noramac entered, despite only recently starting to learn how to use the primitive skates at the time. He believed his six-day experience would overcome his inexperience on skates. The event was again held in Madison Square Garden with 15 skaters. It was said, Poor Noramac could skate very little. He immediately fell into last place and quit the race after 16 miles in an hour and 49 minutes. 
Alexander Snowden, a 22-year-old blacksmith of East Boston, won with a world record of 1,166 miles, and the event was a financial failure. <laughs> Noramak continued his prolific racing in 1887. He was highly competitive. At a six-day race in Philadelphia, where he placed fourth with 501 miles, it was commented, Noramak is very cross and whimsical. The feeling between Noramak and Panchote is very bitter, and they call each other names every time they get close enough. There is some fear that Noramak may lose his temper and get into a personal encounter. In March 1888, Noramak and Robert Vint competed in a novel competition against a female champion Canadian cyclist, Louise Armiendo, at Elite Rink in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The race was for six days, four hours per day. Noramak and Vint's running miles were added together against the cyclist's biking miles. Thousands came each night to watch. Noramak showed some of the remarkable speed for which he is noted, and in several spurts down the side stretches of the track, he held his own against the wheel. In the end, the Ultra Runners won in a very close race all week, 328 miles to 326. In 1888, he moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where many pedestrian races were being held, and opened a cigar store. In April 1889, he won a major six-day race in Pittsburgh with 501 miles, but after that he raced less often and fell out of condition. By late 1889, he discovered that maintaining championship form was becoming harder. He admitted that he was not in top condition, and it showed when he finished last with only 212 miles in a 72-hour six-day race in Pittsburgh, more than 200 miles less than his best. Any winnings earned were far less than in prior years, and his backers lost large amounts of money. But Normack did not give up. He finally won a race in Detroit, reaching 337 miles. His wife helped crew him in his races, watching her plodding husband with constant and anxious eyes. His wife, a large buxom woman, is his trainer and attendant, and there is no more faithful or skillful one in the business. But he was a mid-pack runner and just couldn't break into winning the big races again. He battled injury, causing him to skip months of racing. In March 1891, he ran in a six-day race in Madison Square Garden with 43 entrants. It was billed as a determined attempt to revive the interest in pedestrianism. He reached 525 miles, qualifying him for a share of the profits. Finding it difficult to win money, Noramak went into retirement. In 1896, he married for the third time, Delia Miller in Philadelphia. She had recently divorced her husband. They stayed together for the rest of his life. In May 1899, at the age of 47, he competed in a 72-hour six-day race in New York City at Grand Central Palace on a track 13 laps to a mile. He was the old-timer in the race. He came in last place. Two doctors from the Board of Health visited and threatened to take all the old runners off the track. He continued to try to compete, but always finished in the back. The new Mrs. Noramak would help him during the races. It can be said that Noramak never fully retired from pedestrianism. The sport retired on him. He kept competing to the bitter end in 1903 until most competitions were discontinued due to the lack of interest and local laws put in against such events. In January 1908, when Noramak was 56, Akron, Ohio thought it would be fun to put on a six-day race and invited many of the aging pedestrians for a nostalgic race. Large crowds came out. Noramak appeared periodically on the track and adds to the amusement of the crowds. He came in last with only 73 miles, only able to walk a few days, and not truly trying. In 1910, it was written, The six-day go-as-you-please foot race seems to be a thing of the past, although one or two feeble attempts have been made in recent years to revive the sport. 
We no longer hear of men who have international reputations as six-day runners, and the deeds of the old-timers seem destined to remain on record. Noramak spent his final years operating a small hotel in Philadelphia and still selling cigars. On February 15, 1922, George D. Cameron, Noramak, died at the age of 69 due to pneumonia and contributing heart disease. The class of Noramak in his chosen field may be judged from the fact that he finished in the money in nearly every race in which he took part. He was buried in Arlington Cemetery in Philadelphia, sadly not next to his murdered first wife, Elizabeth, buried and forgotten in New York City. George Noramak was perhaps the most prolific six-day ultra-running in history. It is estimated that he finished about 80 six-day races, reaching more than 350 miles in nearly all of them, and exceeded 500 miles in 12 of them. In all, his career miles in races exceeded 30,000 miles, spanning a 25-year career. Stay tuned for more ultra-running Stranger Things. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>